Great. Well, thanks for the packed room. This is awesome. Uh, I'm Nick Anderson. I'm the AVP of Planning and uh, Operations here at Champlain College. So welcome to our Miller Center. Um, excited to have you here tonight. And um, I'm just going to give a few brief formalities, um, help you kind of get the lay of the land, and then I'll pass it on to some other folks. Um, so in terms of the building, if there's a fire, right behind you is a good way to get out. Also this way, um, there's bathrooms in the back corner of this ground floor level. Um, so feel free to go to that. Um, there's a water station there as well. If you want to refill water, back of the room, we've got some water, some, some snacks, feel free to um, eat as you're here. And so we've got a, a, a packed meeting agenda tonight, um, but we do want to make sure that we leave enough time um, for six and seven um, questions and comments. So we're gonna kind of go pretty quickly through a, through a presentation. And um, I wanna introduce the different folks from um, this team that is working together uh, for this really exciting project. So Champlain College, you know, we're a landowner right here. Uh, and then introduce Charles Dillard, who is our um, the City of Burlington Comprehensive Planner. Give me the name right. Um, oh, oh, there you go. Um, who's also uh, a landowner as part of this project with the 68 Sears Lane property. And then uh, Ride Your Bike LLC, um, which is shown here with three different folks um, yeah. Russ Skelly, Todd Sarandos, and John Colo. And somewhere hovering in the back, Will Flassett. Um, so, yeah, so today we're going to kind of talk about why we're here. What the basics are, project history, and then just really get into it. I think sure. um, if you've got questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to reach out to one of us. But Charles can take away from here. Uh, yep. Uh, right. Um, well, one thing I did want to kind of just talk about is that you know, as part of this NPA, um, we do want to make sure that we're providing a safe space that people can speak up. So this is a, is a forum. It's not a presentation. So we want to hear from you. Um, we're really trying to reduce the barriers for participation, really make it so that, you know, the, the community can weigh in on these, these uh, amazing projects. Um, but we also ask that we're respectful. Um, we make sure that, you know, we're, we're listening to different diverse thoughts and, and comments. And um, really, you know, we're not endorsing political candidates or anything tonight either. We're really just talking about the good stuff. So those are our NPA guidelines that we want to try and stick towards. So. Um, without further ado, Charles, take it away. Thanks, Nick. <clears throat> I got a cookie in my throat. I just want to also <clears throat> say that Brian Pine, uh, director of CEDO, is here from the city as well um, to help answer questions and provide feedback later on. And Chapin Spencer, the uh, director of uh, public works, is across the street at a meeting where I just came from, and he'll be joining us once he's finished, um, hopefully pretty soon. So um, between Brian and Jason and myself, I think we should uh, be well covered on the city side. So <clears throat> basics for the project. Uh, this project, uh, I'm sure as you all know, goes back you know, beyond, uh, far beyond, just the pre-development agreement under which the parties are working today. Um, we'll get into the sort of project history and sort of the history of how the community has informed this project going back 10 years now. But where we are now is that in March of this year, the city council adopted a pre-development agreement uh, between the parties here that Nick just introduced to continue exploring the coordination of a unique opportunity to, to develop a new sustainable, walkable, mixed income neighborhood in the South End. Um, important to stress here is that this is still about exploring opportunities to coordinate. Um, coordinating a development of a scale takes a lot of work and a lot of input from a lot of people. And so, um, the aspiration is to reach a, an ultimately a development goal and, and to coordinate this work together. Um, there's still a lot of work, work to do. So in addition to the property owners, the stakeholders here, you all are here tonight, you've been in many rooms before to talk about development in the South End and the South End Innovation District. Uh, multiple city staff uh, and departments and consultant teams uh, affordable housing organizations like Champlain Housing Trust, Cathedral Square, Evernorth, 
market rate developers, um, so specifically those that will be part of this project will be selected through a competitive process, one or more competitive processes uh, in the coming years, artists and makers, and these are just a few listed here, as well as South End businesses. This is the site. I think most of you are probably pretty familiar with it, but just to orient you, uh, we are here, folks online, I'm pointing at the Miller Center. Um, Champlain College is the owner of 175 Lakeside, which is uh, the easternmost portion here. Uh, Ride Your Bike is the owner of 125 Lakeside, which is the largest property here, uh, the large surface parking lot. And then the city is the owner of 68 uh, Sears. Just another step, snapshot to give you a little bit more orientation. Um, Champlain's property is about 3.7 acres. The city's is 3.3 and Ride Your Bike is 6.3. So, you know, that adds up to about 13 acres, a little bit more. We've obviously got lots of neighbors. Um, the city is a neighbor. Uh, you all are neighbors to Barge Canal uh, as well. And so I think this is really about sort of stitching many disparate sort of portions of this album together ultimately. Hi, everybody. It's great to see uh, a lot of familiar faces. Um, I think that what I'd like to do is just kind of was give a little bit of an overview and, and history of the, of the project, not, not put you to sleep. But in framing the question about <coughs> what are we, what's this project about, I want you to think about it. You know, how does Burlington, you know, when we really take a step back, how does Burlington <coughs> transition from being the big town in a small rural state to being a compact <coughs> urban area, you know, ready to meet the challenges and opportunities of the 21st century? You know, we know that, you know, over the last five years that, you know, between COVID, housing crisis, opioid crisis, you know, social isolation, there's, there's a, a wealth of, of opportunities, but also challenges. And to go back, how the, 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 the not so big question is in, the, in this context is, how do we transform a lava flow of 13 plus acres of pavement into something that is a, a neighborhood, a community that can address housing, that can address you know, some of the social issues that we have, and do it in a way that is respectful of the environment and maybe is less reliant on, on automobiles and more sustainable. So, and it's not just a, for about us, it's for everybody that follows us. You know, we, we really want to create a community that is long lasting. And, and while Lakeside and other neighborhoods are beautiful and have so much integrity, that this was done in 1890 to 1900. We're in the 21st century now. I think we need to really reevaluate, you know, hold on to those, those values of community and inclusiveness and some things that we'll talk about more in greater detail, but it's got to be, it's got to reflect today and tomorrow. So, you know, to go back to, you know, these two questions, just keep that in mind, you know, as we kind of roll through this. So recent history, the, the acquisition of uh, 125 by Russ and Roxanne Scully happened in, you know, around March of 2020. And what we were finding, this was coming on the heels of developing Kula as a co-working. And in talking with all of the founders of the businesses at Hula, we would ask them, what do you need? What do you need now? And what do you need in five years and 10 years? And the, the two questions, the two responses were housing and childcare. Those, those were number one and two, and it was uniform across the board. So, and we had been, thinking Russ was like, you know, I bought a parking lot, you know, it can't just be a parking lot forever. And so we, we went out and we just started informal discussions with stakeholders. We met with neighbors like John Kirby, 
you know, from the, the Lakeside neighborhood. We've met with affordable housing folks. We've met with artisans and, and neighbors. Seba, uh, Steve Conan, um, Generator. Um, we met with uh, business owners and, and, and property owners. And in, in that sense, that's where we really, we had discussions with Champlain College and the city or joining property owners. And that's where the idea of, okay, you know, really we, we should be thinking seriously, not just of, of developing, redeveloping these parking lots, but how can we do it in a collaborative way? And, you know, I can, I can t tell you that, that these things are tough enough to do individually, but, you know, trying to collaborate can bring its own challenges, even additional challenges. But I think the outcome, I think we all agree that the potential of, of, of having a unified development scheme outweighed, you know, the, the you know, the, 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 the trying to get consensus on, on a, a unified you know, set of, 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 of values or objectives. So in general, we, we've been really, really lucky. So that took us um, to uh, up into the summer. So this is March, 2020 to July 21. And uh, Russ and I made a presentation to the planning commission and we, you know, had, and it was like, have you considered, you know, how can we, how can we create housing on a section of the South End that is currently parking lots? You know, the, the economic trends had been that, that the large manufacturing, Blodgett ovens, um, you know, and other manufacturers in the South End have left the city and are in the suburbs now. And, and so it's a, it's a time of change. And meanwhile, we have this housing crisis. So, you know, there's the city had always been somewhat ambivalent about protecting um, the economic development engine that the South End has historically been. But we, we were able to really kind of get a conversation going about housing and, you know, uh, non-residential growth. So that, you know, could we, you know, basically design a neighborhood that would retain non-residential floor area on the grade plane and have housing above. And so, you know, that has been sort of the, you know, the, 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 the driving force. So, you know, that the, the, the request was to make a zoning amendment to permit residential land use. Um, and it took a while, but the, 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 the mayor and the, his administration um, by the end of the year had come up with a 10 point housing program which included a recommendation to um, adopt or, or you know, fulfill uh, a zoning amendment for the South End Innovation Group. So that is kind of the, how we kind of got here. And then from there, um, it, it, the, uh, Charles, uh, which can get into the, the details, um, really kind of took that concept and ran with it in terms of, of developing the, the ordinance that, that we're we're proposing a development now. Maybe I'll give this with that, turn it over to you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Take that from you. Uh, yeah, so John mentioned uh, the previous administration's 10 point housing plan, uh, the Housing as Human Right Action Plan. Um, the precursor to that, from a policy perspective, was Plan BTV South End. Interestingly, can you speak up a little bit? Uh, sure. Uh, Plan BTV South and uh, the engagement process for that uh, began in 2014, so it was 10 years ago. Uh, that planning process culminated in the 2019 adoption of the plan. Uh, I'm sure many of you, how many of you were involved in that process, went to community meetings for Plan BTV South and yeah, a handful of you. Uh, so you're pretty well aware that that plan called for the creation of an innovation district, uh, an enterprise district in the South End. You're probably also aware that it specifically said the community's not yet on board with housing in the South End. So that was 2019, right? And so uh, one year later, 
COVID happened, uh, and then around that time, a local and national conversation about housing, specifically a shortage of housing and a crisis that many communities were facing, uh, began. And so Plan BTV South End, I think, really smartly caveated the sort of continued opposition to housing with a declaration that the community and the city acknowledge that there should be a continued conversation about whether or not housing should be permitted uh, in the South End. So that conversation did continue, um, and it continued uh, and advanced so much and progressed so much that in 2023, uh, last year, uh, a couple of year, a couple of years ago, almost, um, we began the process in 2023. The council adopted unanimously the South End Innovation District, uh, which lays the groundwork for housing in the South End for the first time. Um, that does not mean that the sort of underlying land use framework uh, that prioritizes sort of artists and making and the innovation and office economy that's burgeoning in the South End uh, is not still part of the sort of policy foundation here. It very much is. But I think the South End, South End community, <laughs> others, uh, uh, have acknowledged that, yeah, it's, it's time to build housing in all parts of our city, the South and included. So that's really the policy foundation. There's there's even more policy going back in the comprehensive plan about the city prioritizing specifically sustainable. <laughs> so I got this cookie in my throat. <laughs> um, sustainable urban development, urban design, that sort of thing. Um, the planning rules, I think Will's gonna give me some water to try and get this cookie out. Uh, the planning rules, so these are the zoning standards. Next book. Um, the intent of the South End Innovation District, and I, and I recognize a lot of you who came to meetings during that process, public meetings, planning commission council meetings. So the intent is to create an evolving, vibrant urban district uh, that has a mix of uses and building scales and types. It is a place where more than a thousand homes can be created. Um, you know, the, the city of Burlington has a has a housing target just like every other community in Vermont. And this development will go a long way toward helping the city achieve that housing target. Again, it's a district where the arts, light manufacturing, and expanding businesses can coexist in harmony with new residents. And it can be a 21st century district that limits emissions, cleans our air and water, and fosters a healthy ecosystem. Uh, the core standards, there's many, it's a very complex uh, zoning framework, but the core standards that I think are really relevant are that um, it encourages and allows a mix of building heights, four, six, eight stories. Notably, uh, through a state program, an additional floor can be uh, can be built with an additional um, bonus and density across the site. Modest building footprints, and so I, it's, this is important too. This is all about creating more sort of permeability visually, physically in the district with smaller building footprints. Just for scale context, the building you're in right now is about fifteen thousand square feet in its footprint. So you're talking about buildings of this scale not so much buildings. Um, I think a lot of the buildings at Cambrian Rise, places like that are, are significantly larger. Uh, the, the, the last sort of core standard is about tailored land uses that really sort of prioritize uh, this list that you see here on the screen. Yeah, so it's been 10 years uh, since some of you have been involved. The zoning process itself, itself included multiple in-person, virtual, and continuous online engagement opportunities. We've had, we have a project website. We're gonna stand up a new sort of online engagement opportunity shortly. Uh, that will be live for the next couple of months so that you all can provide feedback um, that we'll receive, that Roger Bike and Champlain will receive, and ultimately the city council will receive as well. Uh, April 20th of last year, uh, just across the street, we had a public open house uh, that was, I think, scheduled just before or after the NPA meeting. 
some of you were there. Um, December of last year, we held another public open house. These images that you see on the screen here were from that event. And we, as this work has gone on, this community engagement really has been about an iterative process where we take community feedback and feedback from our partners and build that into the work that we're seeing. Uh, so yeah, in March of this year, the city council held a, held a hearing on the free development agreement. Um, we do have a website and email list, and I think probably many of you are on that. If you're not and you would like to be, uh, get in contact with us and we'll make sure you get on that list. And every time there's an update on the project, uh, we'll receive an email. So yeah, um, I guess I'll keep rolling with this. Uh, agreed upon design goals uh, for the project are to co-create a visionary urban design, to build a diversity of housing types for a diversity of residents. Uh, I know that the current administration is very interested in looking at what specific uh, demographics, communities uh, need housing in the city and how this project can, can help provide that housing for them. Uh, another one is prioritizing non-residential spaces that expand and support the South End's arts and innovation economy and its multiple unique neighborhoods, responding to the demand for walkability, bikeability, <coughs> and accessibility, and finally, constructing sustainable buildings, streets, open spaces, and ways of living, and tonight you're going to see specifically the work that's been advanced on the design of streets and some open spaces in, uh, in the district will say that what you're going to see is really all about a public realm driven uh, urban design. So just a couple sort of comments about the vision for the project and how it ties in uh, to the South End. So this is specifically about parks and open space. Uh, we know that in the South End, there's a real wealth of a whole range of different types of open spaces and parks. Um, many of you probably live in Lakeside and you have a wonderful small park in the middle of your neighborhood, Lakeside. Uh, Callahan Park is just up the road. We've got Oak Ledge Park, obviously. We've got the bike path connecting a whole sort of like series, of sort of necklace of small parks on the waterfront, Roundhouse Park being one. We've got the Barge Canal here too, which is obviously not a part of, and I think a lot of you are very interested uh, in the future of the Barge Canal, and I think we'd like to see, you know, ultimately how that plays out and how the sort of community's input into the Barge Canal can uh, help sort of create this sort of larger vision of ecological urban sort of design and development in the South End. So this is really about sort of acknowledging elucidating the connections that this development can make between all of these different parks, uh, such that it's a benefit for the people who live and work uh, in the district itself, but for the larger community, can this uh, development sort of be a linchpin and knit together all of these sort of different open spaces. Zooming in just a little bit, the South End is an incredible community, I think, you're all very lucky to live here if you do or to visit here if you have the opportunity to. There's a lot to build on here, and I think the, the parties have been really cognizant of that. Like, this is not about creating something out of nothing. This is ultimately about uh, seeing that great wealth of activity that already happens in the South End um, and, you know, looking at ways that this development can accentuate that, can build upon that, can improve it, can make it more sort of equitable and ultimately economically <laughs> successful. So I want to point out, um, for those of you who do live in the Lakeside neighborhood, one of the sort of objectives here is to improve that connection across the Harrison Avenue uh, rail path. And we've heard a lot about, you know, kids getting to Champlain Elementary uh, in the neighborhood. And I think one thing this project will do is really improve the connection to safety specifically for folks walking uh, and biking up to Pine Street, including kids getting to school. No automobile traffic though, right? Absolutely not. 
How did they get across Champlain Parkway? Oh, that's a great question. I think we we don't have any sections for the parkway, but the parkway, there will be uh, new crosswalks. There will be a signal intersection at Sears Lane, um, ultimately. So that's how they would cut across. And Sears Lane, I mean, the Champlain Parkway, rather, uh, for those of you who have sort of seen the evolution of that street, it's going to be a 25 mile an hour speed limit, uh, two lanes of traffic, uh, generously planted. Uh, the vision for the parkway is not the vision that was initially set out in the 60s where it was a, you know, a freeway or a highway that was gonna be running through the south end. It's more, uh, let's say a slow street that's gonna have a multi-use path alongside it. Uh, part of it is already built along Pine Street, if you've been along that. So I think that's the vision. Um, and I think, obviously, as traffic is, as the parkway is opened up to traffic, I think we'll, we'll analyze how it's functioning. And if it's, if it's not proving to be as safe as the vision, I think DPW and the city will work on ameliorating that. Charles? Yep. You know, yeah, we can talk a little bit. I mean, later on in the slide deck, there's... I think that that the, the parkway design, despite the 25 mile an hour speed limit, if anyone really kind of looks at it, 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 it feels, at least to me, more like Kennedy Drive than, than Main Street. And 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 uh, DPW Chapin, uh, other representatives of the city, I think, are in agreement that um, that making additional connections from uh, our process project across Champlain Park, from 125 to, Ch to Champlain, to this property, um, would, would slow traffic down, make it a safer. So we're, we're exploring conversations with the city, with the VTrans, and ultimately the Federal Highway Administration about what kind of changes could be made, and we can talk a little bit more about that. Is the 68 Sears Lane to Harrison Ave that goes across the railroad tracks. Is that going to open up? It is open today. For vehicle traffic? Oh, no, 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 not to vehicle traffic. traffic. Um, it, it technically is meant to be a secondary access point for emergency vehicles. So if there was a, God forbid, some kind of emergency in the Lakeside neighborhood and Lakeside Avenue itself was blocked, that would be the way that you know the fire and EMT in. trucks would get in. But if you look at it today, it's not exactly accessible, sort of accessible in that way. Right. So part of this project will be a redesign of that. Yes, to limit movement for cars and to allow bikes and pedestrians to go through. But in the event, yeah, that an ambulance needs yeah. to get through, they can. I, I got a question. Uh, right now, you're telling us. <clears throat> Who owns these three parcels? Is that all going to be sold to one person to develop? Or what's right now? You know, we have current three current owners. Mm -hmm. I was thinking I was coming to a meeting that was going to say these are our three current developers. Yeah. You know, but it's called yeah, your, I, your, I, our I, land. No, it's not. Not. Yeah, and right now it's currently owned by these three. That's yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. Is no. there any perspective, guys? I oh, we don't talk about that yet. You know, I <laughs> well, I think there's a memorandum of understanding. There's an MOU, an agreement between those three yeah. property owners to do something inclusive of all of them together. So that's what we're working on right now is we're formalizing those that relationship mm -hmm. and getting an agreement together to ultimately do the whole thing as one project. And but then, that that doesn't mean necessarily that there will be one owner. The 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 planning process or the way that the city accepts accepts the application is there can be three property owners submitting one application together. Yeah. And I think right now that's the sort of working understanding we have. Is there a potential future where some of this property is sold or transferred? Possibly, but I think right now we're all working with the understanding that in 10 years these parcels could remain just as they are today. There will just be a cohesive development on top of them. But perhaps maybe another point, Bruce, is that by 
going through the permit process together, we are collaborating on a unified development scheme. And, and whether it's developed by the three parties or some, you know, one party sells its interest to someone else, you're still going to be bound by those agreements and, and approvals that have been made. So, you know, in, in that sense, we're, we're trying to bake in um, some of the, 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 the positive values of um, mm -hmm. what this development can do. Yep. Okay. Yeah, um, great question about the parkway. I think uh, the only thing I would add to what John said is that today, when or when the parkway opens up, there's going to be very little on the sides of it. And that sort of gives drivers the impression that they can drive a little bit faster. But I think as buildings pop up, it sort of creates more of an environment around them. And I think, you know, the psychology of that shows that people do slow down when they perceive that there's activity uh, alongside the road. All right, um, so this development is not going to happen all at once. It's not gonna happen in the next couple of years completely. It's likely gonna take you know, five, 10 years uh, to build out. There is gonna be a phase process and I think Ride Your Bike is, is, is in the position wherein they would be the first to develop and so I think uh, they can likely answer some specific questions about what that might look like in just a bit. But the idea here is that within the next couple of years, Ride Your Bike will begin developing the phase one uh, and that a new street will be built through the northern portion of the site. We're calling it Innovation Lane for now. Let's see if we come up with a different name. Maybe we can have a, a, a <laughs> survey about that. Name contest. Yeah, a naming contest. Um, just, just to point out the legend here, uh, again, the parkway does have a multi-use path alongside it. It is two-way traffic as is lakeside. Obviously you've got the bike path. The first phase is gonna have innovation lane getting access from Lakeside Avenue, probably still some access from Sears Lane as well but there will be a small sort of new two lane street sort of built through that northern portion. Potential for open space. There's going to be lots of open space, some private, some public in this development. Uh, and that's part of this work that we're working on now. Question. Could you just uh, tell us what larger is as a company? Sure, uh, it is a LLC, which is a property holding company. It's a specific company that uh, Russ and his crew stood up uh, separate from yeah. any other business that they have. It's uh, it's owned by Roxanne and myself. So it's just a two person company that owns that parking lot. And that's really all it is. It's, it's just a, it's a company that owns that property. Yeah, LLC just stands for Limited Liability Corporation. So that's it's a standard sort of company designation for privately owned companies. Uh, does it have to do with bikes? <laughs> <laughs> that's another great question. <laughs> I mean, the short answer to this is that, yes, it's very frustrating to have to buy a parking lot when I felt as though it would be really beneficial for more people to ride their bike. So we call it ride your bike as an idea of try to influence people to not park or drive to work, but instead to ride their bike to work. So yeah, that's why we call it a ride your bike. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> okay, that leads to my question. I understand now. I was thinking at Bike LLC, I was thinking of the bike people down in Burlington. Uh, but <laughs> you're the owner and you've got a different name for yeah, you're the actual owner of Blake LLC. Yes. Okay. That. Yes. Yeah, I thought this property was just three different. We didn't think anyone not, would ever not... know the name of this company. Honestly, we were <laughs> yeah. parking cars for a long time, and then we understood that it probably makes more sense to think about housing, and so that was a that's when all of a sudden people understood that there was a name behind this parking lot. <clears throat> it was called Roger Bike, and otherwise we didn't think anybody would even really care or know what the name of the company was. But, but now it's become more publicized because of this project, so. Yeah. 
could have easily called it old GE parking lot. Right. Mm -hmm. right. A anything. LLC. Or, 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 yeah. or what? 125 Lakeside Avenue at LLC. Right. Yeah. yeah. Boston Red Sox. Queen City Yeah. Ross, yeah. yeah. do you know how many people who work at Hula now ride their bike to work? You've got a huge there's, parking lot. There. Yeah, there, yeah, we have a big parking lot. <laughs> there, yeah, but we we have quite a bit of indoor bike storage at Kula, and well, yes, it's very full most of the time. I mean, you know, in the season and, and the days that are favorable for riding your bike. That's and we're right on the bike path, and so yeah, we like a nice day. There could be forty people <laughs> that ride their bikes, and we probably have on any given day between. Uh, you know, three, four hundred, five hundred people at Hula that show up. We have uh, yeah. twelve hundred members. Not everyone's there every day, so uh, that gives you kind of an idea. Of... One reason for that low bike use is there's no housing in the area for people. To... Right, there are a lot of people are living close enough to where they're working yeah. where they can ride. They're coming from far right. away. A lot of people. Right. One of the things you heard Charles mention is one of the things we'd like to do is de-emphasize the need to own a car if you live in this development project. So some of that same thinking will carry forward in sort of the design and execution of what we build here and who ultimately lives there. Um, because there, we won't have enough space to provide a car for every resident, so or a parking space for every resident. So, so Charles, yeah. that's a good segue into just mobility and connections that we're trying to make. Yeah, we have like, I don't know, like 10 more slides. We're gonna go through them really quickly. There's lots of pictures in the next few slides. I think they're nice to look at. And then we're gonna open it up and just really have a conversation. So. Uh, let me address this. So this is the mobility and open space sort of framework. And this is the, the meat of the work that the parties with our consultant team have been working on over the last few months. Should note that all of this work that we're currently producing right now is being funded by a state grant, a CPMD grant. Um, and that's really with an eye toward developing sustainable urban districts in the state of Vermont. And so this is sort of a perfect example of a project that can be funded by that grant program. Now those commercials, are those buildings actually? Or, or uh, no, these are just properties, parcels. Properties. There's no, so you're not gonna see any buildings tonight. We don't know what those buildings are gonna look like. Um, we know how they're gonna be regulated by the zoning, but that's it. So this is what you're seeing tonight. It's all about the streets, how the look of the streets is, how they feel. Uh, what the open spaces are. Um, yeah, no building. Mary, um, earlier Charles mentioned some of the planning rules. Yeah. And and so you know one of the rules was was an establishment of lot size. So you know what you're looking at, yeah, let's say yeah. parcel mm -hmm. one is three lots. You know, and, and so yeah. it's just know. it's just sort of diagrammatic. Okay. That's you know allows us to really kind of think through how the development could occur. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, image on the left, this is a precedent example. This is a new project that's being built uh, in the Netherlands, but I think this is the sort of like, you know, if, if this, if we could magically build this tomorrow, I think the street would look something like that, Innovation Lane in particular. Uh, so you'll notice here in purple, these are two way streets that cars can drive on. You see the sort of arrows. Uh, given indicating in what direction the traffic can flow. Uh, so obviously the parkway, Sears Lane, uh, there's a proposal to put a, a new road alongside the railroad that then turns internal to the site. Obviously you've got Lakeside. You'll note uh, that Innovation Lane, which runs through the entirety of the south, the site from north to south, is a one-way street uh, with a bike path alongside it with nice sidewalks. You're going to see some images of what that street uh, could look like uh, in the coming years. You also see here um, a new green space. Uh, that's sort of set uh, as, a, as a commitment to the project to build a new public open space right at uh, Harrison Avenue internal to the site. So 
folks from Lakeside, as you're entering the site, you're going to be walking into a nice new sort of public open space and not looking directly at sort of new uh, new buildings. The zoning uh, framework does require that this is a sort of mixed use district, and so that implies that there will be shops and services as part of this. I think we know that. Um, you know, there's a big need for things like child care, um, elder care, other services. Um, so those are all, I think, part of the picture. Ultimately, there's also going to be shops, restaurants, that sort of thing. It's meant to be a convenient sort of dynamic urban district. I think um, uh, one of the architects that we're working with, Roger Bike, uh, hired, uh, did created a really interesting diagram sort of showing the scale of this development compared to downtown. And I think uh, if you were to sort of like take this area and put it on top of downtown, you're really talking about like three, three and a half blocks of downtown. So it's not the largest area, but it's a pretty big significant sort of scale of development. So I think that you see all that sort of dynamic activity happening downtown. Uh, a lot of talent is downtown as well, but uh, you're going to see that kind of environment. It's going to be ultimately a very sort of urban, uh, rich neighborhood. So uh, innovation lane in that first phase, if you recall, there was sort of two-way traffic on that street. So I think the the goal here is to to build a street that can provide access to the buildings that are happening in that first phase of development. Um, just to sort of orient you, this is a section. So if you're looking straight down the street, you know, you've got a sidewalk on one side and a sidewalk on the other side. Uh, traffic, two way traffic here. There's going to be lots of plantings, lots of street trees, lots of green stormwater infrastructure. So if you've walked downtown or in other places that have GSI, St. Paul Street, and along City Hall Park are examples of green stormwater infrastructure where you've got uh, basically rain gardens that are collecting water off the street and the buildings that are then uh, sort of um, basically helping to create these really dynamic, ecologically rich gardens uh, in the streetscape. Is there a bike lane? In the first phase of Innovation Lane, no. But Can I the as we go. Yeah. So ultimately uh, that transition, so as the project phases advance, um, what you're looking at now is essentially the section uh, through Innovation Lane and this Northern section will change as well. And the proposal is to, yeah, include an eight foot or 10 foot, so there's another sort of alternative scenario, uh, multi-use path, bike path, sidewalk on one side, sidewalk on the other side, one-way northbound traffic on that central street with a 10-foot lane, and that's fairly narrow. Um, the, this is a curbless street. And so what that means is that, again, God forbid there's a fire or an emergency, EMT vehicles, fire vehicles, they can actually drive on the bike path too. There's no curb here that would prevent them from doing that. So um, garbage uh, trucks, other service trucks, same thing. So Charles, can I ask a quick question? My oh. recollection with some of the initial survey feedback was there yeah. was kind of a lot of feedback that pushed towards a pedestrianized kind of internal street. Um, is that still kind of a, a vision or is it basically just moving to one way? Uh, so the vision here is one way. Um, I think the pedestrian have a diagram later that kind of shows the divide. Do it the street. We might. Mm -hmm. um, this is my second public meeting tonight. <laughs> um, it's a great question, Evan. This is something that we've talked a lot about with our consultants. I think that um, the reality is today that there needs to be some degree of access for cars. I think the, uh, the intent in the zoning, and I think we've come around to, I think, convincing ourselves that the best way 
that this district can function is much the, in much the same way that new districts are being built in Europe these days, in Asia and South America, where if folks do have to drive to the district, they're parking at the edge and then becoming pedestrians or getting on a bike. Um, there has to be some accessible parking for, both, for folks who do have mobility challenges, who do need to be in a car to move around. Uh, so we needed to make space for some of those people. But yeah, I mean, um, I think ultimately this is not gonna be a street that really you're gonna want to drive on. I think if you are driving through the site, you're gonna be on that westernmost railroad lane here where, you, where there's two-way traffic. I think we're gonna be looking at speed limits that are extremely low here and potentially some sort of weaves in the street uh, that would make it not uh, really convenient to drive on. And so to that degree, yeah, it's not fully pedestrianized, but I think it is, there's a high degree of sort of active uh, mobility here. <coughs> yeah, so this is just the, the alternative sort of scenario where that, that bike path is 10 feet wide. So in total, you're talking about 16 and a half feet of bike path infrastructure on one street. Across the street, there's points at which that streetscape is 20 feet wide for, for pedestrians. Again, lots of plantings. You'll note that the buildings have this frontage area, and that's really to also sort of encourage, in some cases, require, we can build this into the development agreement requirements that these buildings be fronted by lots of plantings and GSI as well. So again, just to point back to that image, uh, this image, Lots of green uh, space in the street. You see these as well. These are examples of projects where um, rather than being fully mixed use, there are residences directly at street level. So uh, you might imagine uh, some of these streets, particularly cross streets in the sort of southern portions of Innovation Lane, looking something like that, where folks are walking right out of their sort of front door onto this leafy green streetscape. So you noticed also there's a couple of cross streets. Sorry, I'm going back and forth here. These cross streets, um, this is aspirational, mind you. Um, right now, the city does not have full control of the Champlain Parkway. I'm still counting on Chapin to walk in the door any minute now. Um, but ultimately the aspiration here is to create at least one intersection across the parkway that would be signaled, there would be a light, there would be crosswalks, uh, Champlain, it would help tie Champlain's property into the project. Uh, so those cross streets are going to have this kind of character, likely one side of on-street parking but again, in much the same way that Innovation Lane would be designed and constructed, you've got lots of sort of planting, street trees, that sort of thing. So this is a plan uh, looking, you know, sort of bird's eye view of what it could look like. Sears Lane here on the right, Lakeside on the left, and the cross street. So you can see lots of street trees, lots of sort of green frontage to the buildings, lots of these little alleyways and sort of small pocket public spaces. Uh, all throughout the site. So it's very much likely that, you know, when you're walking through the district, you might take a turn through this block and then walk through an interior courtyard, that, that sort of thing. Just zooming in to the sort of plan. Is it gonna be so people can um, bus in or, and bus out of there? Um, that's a great question. Um, let me go back. that I jumped over. You see these circles with mobility hubs? So mm -hmm. mobility hub, think, don't think parking structure, think a structure that is all about mobility and transportation options. Yeah, there's gonna be some structured parking in it, but there's also gonna be some really high quality indoor bike parking facilities, probably some showers for people. I just got so, my pants are so, <laughs> Like dripping wet right now. And um, for people who are biking, you know, shower facilities, locker facilities, that sort of thing, transit facilities. So you notice here in the parkway, this is not in the plans for the parkway right now, 
but our party's aspirationally, we've all agreed that having better transit access to the site is something we should push for. So intervening in the parkway to get some bus sort of pull out areas adjacent to these mobility hubs would mean that these mobility hubs would have indoor sort of transit waiting areas as well for people waiting for the bus, particularly in the winter. Um, so it's really, and you know, talked car about car share pods. Car share pods, mm -hmm. that's another thing. So I think, you know, Roger Bikes really led this discussion early on by saying, you know, we envision having a sort of large bank of car share cars in these mobility hubs so that people don't necessarily have to own their own vehicle, but if they need a car, like many people do in Burlington or Vermont, they can get one. Um, does that, did that answer your question yes. about buses? Currently, yeah. the GMT buses go up and down Pine Street. Right. We have had some conversations and we'll continue to discuss with them um, sort of how their uh, bus planning might change. Yeah. Notably, uh, once, if, and when the parkway fully opens, Pine Street will close at its southern, it will have a new southern terminus. So it's likely that some of that bus routing that's on Pine Street today could move to the parkway. Mm -hmm. Can't commit to that now, but it's an option. So yeah, so this is phase one. This is how it could look. Uh, again, two-way traffic. You've got a large portion of the existing parking lot still here, helping to sort of service the folks who are living in these uh, buildings here. Phase one, uh, continuing to build out. So once sort of the, the project moves south, that road turns into a one-way street with this bike path on one side. Again, you can see here, even on the private property here, you're seeing the streetscape extend into that private property such that the street, when you're walking on it, uh, it's gonna feel much wider than that image was suggesting where the sidewalk was only looks like seven feet. It's gonna feel much wider. Um, the goal here again is to be a place where, you know, it's very comfortable and enjoyable to walk. Just moving down a little bit. You'll notice small pockets of on-street parking on Innovation Lane. Again, there's gonna be a need for accessible parking for some people. There's gonna be a need for sort of quick pick up, drop off, that sort of thing. Uh, but for the most part, for people who are spending a lot of time in the district, I think if they have a car, it's gonna be in one of those mobility cars. Is there any consideration or possibility for underground parking? Also, you all have lots of great questions. Yeah, um, I think maybe uh, John and, and Nick can help me with this one. But I think that ultimately the goal is to build as little structured parking as we can. But the realities um, are that while Burlington doesn't have, doesn't require parking, and in fact, we do have parking maximums, there has to be parking today. Um, a lot of what's driving that is actually investors. So in the world of real estate development, you know, when a developer goes um, to look for investors to help build a project, a lot of them will say, you know, we need, you're gonna need the parking and we're not gonna give you the money unless the parking is there. And that is just the reality today. And so there will be some underground parking uh, underneath these buildings. There will not be uh, sort of like structured parking above ground connected to each of these buildings. You know, that's well stated, Charles. You know, that there, there, there will be opportunities um, or locations on the site where um, constructing below grade parking may make sense. Like for example, at the, the northwest corner, right as Lakeside Avenue goes underneath the railroad, you know the the the, the, the depth of excavation would be relatively minimal compared to other parts of the site. So it could be considered there. But it, having said that, it's it's all you know, below grade parking is expensive and to construct, and and so 
like any project, you know, there's, you know, the, the wants, you know, what, what do you want in the project, including parking or not? And, you know, and what does it cost? And can you make it all work and, and balance out? Thank you. What about utility folks? Is there any possibility for all of that yeah. going underground? Um, we have the benefit of the city of having some super smart people in our public works department. And Roger Bike and Champlain have also brought on their own consultants. And I think, yeah, we're all thinking, I don't think you're going to see utility poles. A lot of that stuff is going to be in the ground. We're also thinking really progressively about wastewater infrastructure, efficiently about that, um, how this development can not just sort of serve itself from that perspective, but also provide uh, more sort of to John's point, 21st century wastewater infrastructure in the South End. Yeah, so I think, you know, there's other other types of infrastructure. Um, I think we've heard a lot about sort of geothermal. I mean, Kula at Rust Fields is one of the most sort of, from a sustainable perspective, one of the most advanced buildings, I think, in the state, if not the most. And, and I think they're bringing that ethos to this project. And I think obviously the city has its own net zero goals and, Champlain is also a very sustainable institution. So yeah, I think from that perspective, you can expect infrastructure to be hidden, to be efficient, to be sustainable, yeah. Um, Maybe what, 30% of the campus footprint is heated and cooled with geothermal or something like that? Yeah, yeah so currently uh, up on the hill, Champlain College has a, a lot of geothermal. Um, we've got a lot of our buildings already connected to it. So we. We have been working with geothermal energy for 15 years now. Um, and I think, you know, as, as it makes sense down here, uh, it's a, an amazingly sustainable way of keeping and cooling your buildings. Is there, yeah. is there any consideration, sorry, for where the bike path is crossing, like South Cross Street and North Cross Street? Um, I think one of the things on the bike path that's frustrating as somebody who commutes year round by bike is um, it's every time that it meets a street, the, you know, in Europe, a lot of times you have continuous crosswalks where, or continuous sidewalks where the traffic going on these cross streets or side streets is uh, going up to and yielding to traffic on the bike paths. And so it would be nice to see somewhere like us implementing that um where you know the bike path basically continues as a marked bike path through the crosswalk as well as pedestrian traffic and then you know car traffic is going up and over kind of the way that church street is delineated so it'd be it would be but nice to see that as an option yeah uh great comment Evan. did everybody could everybody hear that i understand what it, okay great um, he was really talking about, so in the plan here, you see these, the bike paths sort of like stopping and getting cut by the crosswalk and here by the street. Um, yeah, that's a design move that can be changed. I will say though that a lot of these intersections, I think, are sort of tabled and that sort of means they're raised up. Again, there's no real curb here. So when you're riding a bike, when you get to the intersection here, you're not having to sort of tra traverse a ramp and then go down a ramp and back up a ramp. You're just driving straight across. It's actually the cars. If you're driving on the cross street, I'm driving this way. I'm sort of like coming up onto a big bump here and driving across that, what we call in the sort of transportation planning world, a table. Um, but yeah, that's a, nothing in here is set in stone. This is all about collecting feedback again. So we can take this back to the consultants and, See if we can sort of redesign that. You might have good news for you. Yeah. Is it fame? You might have good news for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, my news in time. <laughs> Usually that's the case. <laughs> no, so, yeah, that, that concludes our. We went way over what we were supposed to do here, but yeah, so now is your time to provide feedback, ask us questions. Again, we've All got. Right. Parking. Parking. parking lakeside right now with the parking lot that's there for hula does not have parking whenever hula has an event we're we're full yeah okay so there's things that are going on that my tenants can't park because someone's going to the beach 
or going to a hula event or doing something. That's a major issue. Now you're talking about building a thousand more units. Okay, now all those units are not going to be people that are going to be working right here. Some of them are going to be working elsewhere and are going to need vehicles. So where are those going to work? What happens when there is another hula event? And now we have another thousand cars coming into the neighborhood that there is no parking for. What do we do with those? Yeah, so I mean I'll I can I can answer part of this question and I think we can turn it over mm -hmm. to Russ. And I think we can can help answer some of this too. Um there's I think in the development framework, there are, you know, we said we want to build small amounts of parking, but there actually is quite a lot of parking built into these mobility hubs and in each of these buildings where there's underground parking where possible. You know, you're talking, you're not talking one car per unit. We're talking less than that. Yeah, there's going to be lots of cars parked here and those people are going to have to pay for that parking space. And ultimately the city, I think the city understands, knows about the challenges in the lakeside neighborhood. Um, and I think there's efforts to mitigate some of that. And I know it's not, it's not happening as quickly as probably you would like it to, but. Well, don't get me wrong. I don't want to see anything like residential only parking. Yeah. Because I hear that's a nightmare for even the residents. Yeah. But there, if you don't provide the parking, we're going to be dealing with more and more of it. Yeah. John, I think the, in the, the preliminary plans, I think there's, a, 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 I was going to say 1100 parking spaces, 1,200, including in structure, some below grade, some on the street. But I think that the total number was in that range. Mm -hmm. So where you see the two mobility hubs, those are, you know, those are, those are parking structures that are, we just call them mobility hubs because they have all the other amenities that Charles spoke of. But so those, there's parking there, there's parking underneath the building. We definitely know that we can't just decide that, hey, we want to have this cool uh, development and we want it to be car free. So therefore it should be car free and everyone who lives there is going to not have a car. Um, you know, that, that it's unrealistic. Yeah, it's unrealistic. Yeah. Right. At this day and age. At this day and age. Now, maybe 10 years down the road, it won't be. <laughs> Absolutely. Right right. Now. Although we know, we can say that, that, I mean, it's counterintuitive, but some of the, the crossings and the, the suggestions that we made actually kind of have been demonstrated in larger markets, the Boston's, the Montreal's, that it does reduce parking and, and, and gets people out of their cars. And, and again, Vermont is sort of an outlier, and it's yet yeah, it's an urban area, but but it, we're in a rural state. Exactly. So we we understand that, but I think that um, uh, the the city's consultant as well as as our consultant, I think, are somewhat in agreement that this is a this is a, a progressive and a reasonable path forward. My pet peeve is riding through who is parking lot on a bike and not see, I see all these empty spaces that there's nobody there. And a guy parked in front of um, Wright Avenue the other day and he says, I'm sorry to park here, but I can't afford the $80 that Hula charges them. Well, so That's we are we are working uh, closely with PBW, uh, Hula is. Um, to address some of the issues of why, you know, like I said, we have 1,200 members. Yes. We probably have anywhere, say on average, 400 of those members are, sh are showing up on any given day. We probably have, we don't know, we're trying to, we're trying to work to collect this information so we know what the scope of the problem is. Somewhere maybe between 10 to maybe 20 people from Pula are parking in uh, the lakeside neighborhood. Right. And so yeah, a lot of those. Yeah, yeah, I think it's more than that. Wait, really so, well, so let's, we're going to find out because we don't really. drive around the other day with our groceries and she couldn't even park in front of her yeah, house. I understand. So we, so we, we know that we need to do some investigation to figure out what that problem is and get our, so we know what we're dealing with as numbers. A lot of those people are people who are visiting Ula, they're there for a meeting, they're there for an event, they're there for a day pass or a half day pass. So we don't capture those people in advance. We don't have a lease or a contract with any of those people. So we need to do a better job of managing those one-time visitors 
So because it's public and it's free, it's just this natural attraction. So let me try here first. So um, we've had some discussions even today and, and we're gonna, um, you know, there's, we posted a reply on Front Porch Forum today. So that just came out at like probably three o'clock-ish. So we're, we're getting the wheels in motion to really address this. It's been a difficult um, we, one we didn't anticipate. Yeah. Russ bought this big parking lot in order to address the parking. We have plenty of parking. Yes. But it's getting yes. people to use it when right next door, right down the street is free, free. public parking. It's very <laughs> Yeah. So why wasn't that included on the rent space when they rent an office space? Why wouldn't that have been included? Honestly, in if you had about? free parking in on the <laughs> lakeside neighborhood and at Ride Your Bike. And you have free public parking in the lakeside neighborhood. They're still going to go to. They're still going to. No, but I mean, not not for, not say that it's for parking. Just include that in there. Things saying. It, um, actually, in our leases, uh, it is included that there's no parking allowed in the lakeside neighborhood, and then you can even name the streets. But how many how many parking spaces are on site? So behind the, the two hula buildings on Lakeside Ave, we have 381 parking spaces. Some of those are tandem spaces. Those we charge $30 a car <coughs> per month. Some are um, then single spaces, and those are $70 a month. Mm -hmm. Then we have a, a little over 800 parking spaces at the Ride Your Bike Lot right over here. And those are anywhere from $40 a month to $60 a month. So all of them are what you might call subsidized or below average, below market rate, like way below market rate. What is market rate of? So even at the mall tax building, you know, they're charging $100. And then the Hula parking spaces, guys, are also assigned. So if you're driving through and you see a lot of empty parking spaces, those are assigned to specific tenants who have, are renting that specific spot. Yeah. So I understand the frustration. Hey, I see all these empty spaces. Yeah. You can't park there because that's someone else's space. space. And it's actually patrolled and monitored. So and that, that's why they're numbered. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So to, to be perfectly clear, this isn't all Hula's fault because yeah. some of it's got to be parks and rec because we get so many people that go to Oak Ledge because they don't want to pay the $2 parking fee and they park down in Lakeside. And I see tons of them do that. Right. Yeah. And they park there to go on the bike path. Yeah. So yeah. there's all kinds of reasons for them taking up. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah. or, or St. John's Club is is also yeah. a big user of the street parking. I'll say that. As somebody who works at Hula and lives in the South End and commutes by bike, we, we I constantly go by. We, we are, uh, we're contributing to the problem. We would like to do as much as we can do to figure out what we're, what we're actually contributing to it and see how we can limit that. So Are all of your rental spaces uh, spoken for? Uh, in, within the building? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah we're completely they're all full. Sold out. We've been completely full since yeah. we've opened. And so just, you know, there's, uh, with co-working, people don't come every day right. to the office. Sure. Uh, even the office tenants that have 30, 40, 50, 60 employees and people, those offices, for the most part, as as you heard the trend across the country, is there a lot of people are working from home. The office space is not very full as far as employees showing up on a day-to-day -day basis. But everything is rented. So that's another reason why you're seeing this parking lot. You're driving through and you're like, geez, well, like, yeah, where is everyone? Right. That explains yeah. it. So thank you for yeah, explaining I just, that. You got it. I just want to say one more thing on this topic, and then I know we have a comment here. Um, I know your neighbors who live on this side of Pine Street have similar situations where folks who are going to zero gravity or some of the other spots on Pine Street are parking in those neighborhoods. <laughs> The goal with these mobility hubs is that there will be some degree of public parking and that these can absorb some of the demand for people who are going to businesses and services on Pine Street. So this is another way that I think we see as a city and I think the parties will agree that the development can help sort of ease some of the parking and transportation challenges so elsewhere in the South End. Define a mobility hub a little more than you did. I mean, kind of elaborate <laughs> on that. Is it 
is it going to be a parking garage with there will, high school parking and everything yeah, else? Yeah, mm -hmm. ground floor will have active uses, might even have, you know, shops, might have a cafe in it. So just ground floor? Uh, no, well, on the, you know, the parking structure itself will likely have a bank of car share cars. There will be probably a very large indoor bike parking facility that could be one, two, three floors. We don't know how many bikes one needs to park. I think the aspiration is for something that's not just a room this size for bikes. It's probably a little bit bigger. So it's going to be a bike garage, not a parking garage for cars. It'll yeah, be a lot of, it's uh, going to be every. It's, it's going to be lot. all of these things. Is it okay. helpful to guesstimate the number of parking spaces you expect in these buildings? That might help. Well, I think uh, a couple hundred. This one, yeah. I think, will have a couple hundred, and this one is is closer to four or five hundred. Yeah. Um, parking for cars. Yes. Lots of parking for cars, but some of those. So some of those spaces are specifically reserved for Champlain College. Yeah. Some of those spaces are reserved for the public. Some are reserved for car share cars. Some for you know uh, right now some of these spaces are leased for institutions. I think the goal is to sort of move away from that, but that might be part of the reality in the short term. As we said earlier, there nothing's just, been designed. They're just there's yeah. placeholders for you know you know carry six hundred parking spaces out here, bike spaces, whatever. I just have two quick thoughts. Yep. One, do you guys work? Ask DHA. I live in Decker Towers, the yeah. DHA property, okay. and I noticed that THT and other, did anyone ever talk to DHA about any of this? Did they say they didn't want to be involved? Or we're having a lot of issues with DHA, and we're trying to figure ways to straighten them out. And I know this this project isn't really working with them. Is there any way that? We could maybe get BHA to push a little to help as far as helping with a housing issue or we have not uh, specifically had conversations with BHA. Um, Brian conveniently left the room and asked this question. <laughs> this is his, his question. Um, no, I have not had conversations with BHA. Is anything on the table? Absolutely. I know BHA um, you know, has a, like every sort of uh, institution right now, a budget shortfall and, and challenges from that perspective. So, but yeah, um, I, we did mention that the current administration does have priorities for uh, specifically looking at different demographics and what the housing need might be. There's been conversations with Cathedral Square, with CHT. Um, there's organizations providing housing for folks with developmental disabilities. I think that part that's going to be on the table. I think there's going to be some workshops. There's already been a number of roundtables with these housing organizations, Vermont Housing Finance Agency as well. Um, you know, I think Roger Bike and Champlain are very much aligned with this vision of creating um, a, a whole spectrum of housing for the whole spectrum of different residents and communities. And I think Brian's about to come back in the room. So, but we can say, um, Dave, that you know the the, the organizations and the nonprofits that we have engaged with are the the local nonprofits that are, from our view, the most active in in developing and constructing new affordable housing at, at the senior level cathedral square champlain housing trust you know for, for family i was thinking that was part of the problem because bha they tend to renovate old properties instead of buying properties and i just wondered if that was part of the hangout because i think bha should i've had a lot of difficult i live bha i'm on <laughs> committees and i'm fighting with them in a lot of ways yeah, but I'd like to see them somehow step up and help along the project. Yeah, but yeah, we, we were trying to use the work with those that that have a lot of experience in new construction. So it would, you know, they would they would. Be yeah. And then the other thing I wanted to bring up, there's been some talk in our neighborhoods and stuff. It would be nice to really contemplate a community center for this. And maybe placement like a, around the innovation street or something act as like a welcoming center, put some history in it, set up a uh, hub where you could park your cars and then grab bikes or walk or whatever. 
uh, I really think a community center would, I think we need to make this area kind of a, a destination now. Mm -hmm. And to make it, we can, you know, and employ like so this Lake Erie history, maybe the bar canal, some history from that. Can we? I noticed you have a lot of European and Asian slides and stuff. Can we try to make this area uniquely Burlington? Yeah, in a lot of ways. Yeah, that's a great comment, and I know that. Um, Jack sitting next to you and a lot of other folks from the Ward 5 MPA have spearheaded a conversation about community facilities in this project specifically, but in the larger South End. And I think that, um, you know, um, the reality is there will be community facilities in the South End. Um, there's space for it in this development. There's space down the road at Pine, on Pine Street. Um, you know, I know that you all, some of you may have had conversations with um, Burlington City Arts and they are uh, developing 405 Pine Street and that building will have a community space in it, community meeting space in addition to the sort of arts and sort of making studios that are already there. And I think with the further development of the Champlain Parkway, it's gonna be easier for everybody, you all included, to, to get to and from there by walking and biking. But is that one, if that one community meeting space at 405 Pine is not enough, I think we need to keep hearing from you. And then, yeah, that um, I should generally say that what you're seeing tonight is a lot about the sort of the streets, um, the work of designing the buildings is going to come later, the work of determining exactly what we call the program. So, what sort of uses are going to be here, like things like childcare offices, sort of dental, you know, offices, that sort of thing. That's all going to come later. And there can be commitments in the development agreement, ultimately, if that's what this comes to, to um, trying to or aspiring to getting some of these community facilities and other uses that, that folks specifically want into the development. So I would say, yeah, if, if you're not seeing what's happening on the ground already at 405 Pine Street being enough, and you think the community needs more facilities uh, for any range of activities, keep knocking down our door with that and um, it'll make its way into it. Charles, maybe just one other thing just to add to that is that with any of the, the non-residential uses that are being discussed, whether it's a childcare center or a bike shop, you know, the, there's basically the, the, the childcare provider or the bike shop merchant is coming to us saying, I, I need 2,500 square feet. I need area for 50 kids or 100. So we extrapolate that to a, a community center. We would, I think we're happy to consider it, but it's it's who's, you know, what, what have you got? What, have, what do you have in mind? You know, and, and who are you really serving? What are the components of it? So we can have a, an intelligent conversation about where that community center should reside within the within the neighborhood. So, is there any um, date set for Champlain Parkway to open to Sears Lane to Pine Street? Okay. Champlain Parkway to open up to it does. No, when's it, no, when's when's it, it going, going to be open? open? Oh. Like two years. years. Just kidding. Yeah, exactly. That that was his question. <laughs> answer to how soon is the parkway day? Oh, he said two years. Two years. Two years. Um, four weeks, and we'll be in touch with news very soon about how that's going to all roll out. It's going to add to four weeks. Mm -hmm. Only, only the section between Lakeside and Home Avenue. There will not be an interstate connection until right. the final phase right. of the project is done. So four so, weeks. Oh, nice. We got all yeah. the blood is coming out of his hand. <laughs> yeah. Thanks over here. Um, really appreciate your commitment to uh, green infrastructure and lots of street plantings and um, uh, like water catchment and ecologically sound ways. Just wondering if it's already a part of the plan to uh, some at least informal commitment or idea of uh, planting with ecologically active native plants to do that. Yeah, I mean, um, 
Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, the All of the plantings that are part of the great streets downtown that have already been implemented are using those kinds of plants. And I think that's the, the goal is to, yes, I think the, the city is always interested in sort of local plant, native plants, ecologically sustainable work. We do have Offshoots, which is a landscape architecture firm that is, is helping advise the, the landscape architects and architects who are drawing these things up. And yeah, and as this project develops, there's always going to be that sort of component to it. Yeah, great question. And if you have a specific interest and want to be part of that, yeah, let's stay in touch. Uh, yeah. I just want to bring this back to the, this question about the community center. It's really clear that the design of the streetscape is to bring people in and to turn this into a neighborhood, not just another ugly development. Mm -hmm. um, and I really appreciate that intention. It's not going to work without civic infrastructure. So I, I hear and appreciate your invitation that we, um, all of us un, unpaid, uninvited community members put in all this work, and we will. Um, we will continue to knock down your door. Um, and, and also just want to invite you to to have this really be a part of the process, not just designing the street, designing the buildings, thinking about how this becomes a real place and not just a bunch of buildings on a former parking lot. Those community spaces are what make people want to live in, in any neighborhood and for your prospects as developers and as creators of homes, home is not just a building, it is also a place to gather. So just want to make a, a really strong pitch that you need this um, and we are all, I think, here to help build that, whether it's folks who have lived in Lakeside for forever or people who are newer to the neighborhood, that is such an essential part of making this actually fit in the South End. Thank you for that That's comment. Important. I can say that personally, I agree 100% with you. I think there have to be community facilities. I can also say that, you know, we have a new mayor uh, she's been in office for a, a few months. She's just now coming in out of that budget hole and getting to pop her head out and to look at different initiatives. And I think that um, what were the, the sort of early signs all pointed, yeah, a lot of community, not just engagement, but participation, participation and, you know, creating the program. And I think um, leveraging 68 Sears Lane as a city resources to get community objectives built is very much her goal here. Um, so I think, yeah, um, I think you're, you're spot on. Good urban districts need good community facilities. And I think, you know, it's something I will uh, advocate for in my position. Same with us. Um, we, we've got some other folks who've not had a chance yet that. to speak. So From first, let's go uh, to you, the blue shirt, and then we'll go back. Thank you. Hear what you're saying. I agree. <laughs> Um, I'm kind of late to this whole process, um, and when I started thinking about it, I started thinking about it from the point of view of we need housing, which people keep throwing at you. So my emphasis has been on the housing aspect of this whole project, and I'm disappointed that you're not considering the buildings because I spent a lot of time thinking about the buildings and the kinds of like air conditioning and you know, air that should be in them or the kinds of provisions that would prevent people from buying units and then selling them for a profit and you know, that whole thing and you know, making them owner occupied, creating a community. Yeah. And with the three groups that are involved, the city, the college, you know, and the like uh, place which has a really good reputation. Um, it seems to me we have an opportunity to do a marvelous housing development and I wouldn't do it in pieces, I'd do it all together. And I think, you know, I was thinking there should be some architectural niceness that makes it feel like home, you know, so that when people enter it, they have this special feeling. I also have real questions about height. You know, four four stories to me seems like a very good height. When you go six, eight, you're talking about changing the whole dynamics of the neighborhood. And once you have this, which is a first, then others are going to follow. And, you know, I, I talked to John briefly and mentioned there's a place in Florida, Stewart, 
Whitney is right on the ocean and the Atlantic Ocean, and they have a four story height restriction. And everyone around them has, you know, high rises out the kazoo. And it creates such a niceness in this community, you know, that a lot of people love it just for that reason alone. But, um, you know, I know there are a lot of people who want to, who want to speak, but, you know, to this uh, young lady's, um, you know, comments, to me, I mean, a lot of this is whiz bang, you know, restaurants and bringing in people. I don't vision it like that. I vision it as being a place for people to live. And yes, there can be some places for people to work Small. that would fit in, maybe a drugstore, maybe even mm -hmm. a police you know, uh, station outlet. But also, you know, I, I, would, I couldn't help but think, but how about places, you know, like playgrounds for young kids? How yeah. about, you know, gardening for people, you know, yeah. public gardens? How about a basketball court, yes. you know, where you can throw a few hoops and maybe in the winter time you take it down and you flood it over and you make it a skating rink, you know? Yeah, great um, point. Um, I should have included yeah. some of the old president slides. We had a very cool basketball court that we were showing that was an example of an open space. Um, your first point about buildings, I did not mean to give you the impression that we're not going to be thinking about the buildings. We're not there yet. That's a whole level of complexity and cost. Um, right. And ultimately, I think, you know, the way we're approaching this, I said this earlier, and it was a jargony term. I said it was a public realm driven urban design. But what that really means is first, we want to come out with the vision for the public spaces, which includes the streets and some of these open spaces, and then make the architecture sort of conform to that. I think that's really the smartest way to design a district rather than to start with the buildings and then fill in the public realm. Because ultimately, when you're traveling to these fabulous places you go to, the spaces you enjoy the most are the streets, the parks, the plazas, and that sort of things. So we want to get that right early and then make sure, yeah, the buildings, I think everybody here agrees, parties, and I think you all probably share a lot of the same ethos. They need to be sustainable. They need to be beautiful. They need to be comfortable and they need to be sustain uh, efficient. So that's going to happen. That will be, there will be hopefully a development agreement that's going to further sort of define what these buildings should, should look and feel like. We're doing a lot of work uh, with the mayor and her team, uh, ultimately going to be working at a state level to push for changing the building code to allow us to build more buildings out of mass timber, which is a sort of modern, sustainable sort of way to build buildings. Mm -hmm a lot less embodied carbon than concrete and steel, nicer buildings generally. We want to get that kind of building in the space. Um, definitely going to be looking at things like gardens and playgrounds and all that sort of stuff. That's also going to come. So I think you're seeing these sort of like, you know, dotted green boxes here. There's going to be lots of public spaces, like I said earlier, lots of private spaces. The folks who are going to live here are going to have, you know, probably roof deck sort of gardens and patios as well. I think the vision here, again, setting the building footprints at 15,000 square feet is all with the intention of creating nice green spaces. I'm looking out the window and there's like a beautiful rain garden back here. And I think that's sort of the vision to have. And I know it's just a place to store water for St. Frank College in the city, but it's beautiful and it's probably ecologically pretty important for this area. So definitely going to be looking at that. That's part of the program. We very much consider open space program part of that sort of same discussion about you know restaurants and that sort of thing. On the point of restaurants, this diagram is pretty complicated to look at, but if you look at the legend here, the darkest red, these are active uses only. So the only areas in this whole sort of plan where you see the most active uses are in this first phase. So if there's going to be restaurants and that sort of activity, almost certainly going to be sort of up toward the northern end on the corners. On the corners here, you see all uses except residential. So smaller non-residential establishments, community facilities, that sort of thing. You've also got that here on Champlain's property. Uh, when you look at the city's property, it's almost exclusively residential, a lot of this type of uh, development. So 
It's not. The reality is that in Burlington and across the country, there's a, a glut of vacant commercial space. And we knew that when we were crafting the zoning. And the planning commission and the council were smart in adopting the zoning the way they did because there's lots of ways that the requirement for ground floor uh, non-residential uses can be reduced, acknowledging that reality, but in exchange getting more public benefits. For example, in the zoning, you're required to sort of provide a certain amount of square footage on your ground floor for non-residential uses. But you can get out of that by building more public open space next to that building. So let's say I build a building, I might be required to put 5,000 square feet of commercial space or non-residential space in that ground floor. Let's say I don't think I can find a tenant or I don't want to do that. I'm going to build a public community garden right next to it and get out of that requirement. So that's the kind of, those are the kinds of tools that we built into the zoning. I think you're going to be happy ultimately with the amount of open space in this project. And could I just add one other thing? This is a pet peeve. Over the years, watching buildings go up and the balconies that are put on the buildings are, you know, so small, you're lucky if you can get two chairs on them. Yeah. And not having them face toward a pleasant garden area, mm -hmm. you know, or tree area rather than on a street, yeah. you know, um, and I know that's not quite what you're talking about, but I have to get that in. <laughs> Great point. You're taking notes, guys. Yeah. Um, let's see. We had a question here, and then we'll go to you after that. Um, so two things. First off, I just want to echo the comments that have been made so far about civic infrastructure. That feels like the world's easiest way to win here. You know, not only is that what helps make a place really feel like home instead of just a housing development. It's also such an easy way to integrate a new community with the existing communities around them. If you have places for people to gather, that, that helps people meet the new arrivals and helps people integrate into the existing communities. So I think that's a really exciting opportunity here. And the other thing is just, I have to say, I came to this meeting with a lot of optimism and I feel a little disappointed looking at this diagram. I feel like we're not even living up to our local best example. You know, the nice part of downtown is Church Street, and that's because there's no automobile traffic. And, you know, you, you described walking into this space from Lakeside and seeing a nice green space rather than buildings, which I like the sound of that, but what I see looking at the back here is actually what I see is a two-way automobile traffic street. So I, I just have to wonder with incredulity, is Champlain Parkway really not enough for this? Do we really need, depending on any kind of five or six additional streets for automobile traffic here? It just, it feels like a lot for the size of the space for what could instead be really great walking pathways and really shared public spaces where people can just walk across the street, say hi to their neighbors without having to worry about anything on their crossing. No, that, that's, a, that's a great point. And, and it's a balancing act that there's um, always going to be a, in, a, in a district, in a, in a neighborhood, an urban neighborhood like this, there's going to be back of the house service, trash removal. I mean, the, the reality is, is it's going to be, there's going to be a need for hardscape paved purposes. What I think Charles and the team has tried to do is acknowledge that and, and design shared spaces that don't that don't read so much as a roadway with the flush curbs and and basically uh, incorporating a lot of hardscape and landscape materials so that it, again it, it it it's it's urban there's no doubt about that but but that it 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 I think embodies the, the things that you're pointing to or, or expressing um so it's a challenge and and then you know there's there's the, the other piece of it, which is, you know, you got to keep the fire marshal happy to be able to fight a fire in the event. So it's, it's, it is this, this, you know, delicate dance to, to get to where everybody feels that, you know, this is what the community wants. Yeah, the point is well taken. If I can just add a couple of points here. 
The Champlain Parkway is limited access. And what that means is <coughs> we, because we don't control it, we don't know what kind of interventions we can ultimately make in the short, near, long term. We need new roads internal to the site to get cars, services, emergency access into it. So there has to be some new streets in the site. We can't put curb cuts and new intersections on the parkway. That's an unfortunate reality for us right now. Will that change ultimately? We don't know, hopefully, yes. This is a relationship, um, you know, um, I've advocated strongly for a lot of the things that you, I think, have advocated for. Um, as a representative of the city, I have specific uh, objectives uh, advocating for those things. Um, Roger Bike and Champlain have their own objectives. I mean, they're, when, when you're looking to develop, you know, real estate and lots of people are putting a lot of their money into it, there's realities about cars and parking. And we, this has been a balancing act. And like, is it perfect if I was, you know, designing this by myself, would, would it look like this? Probably not, but would it look like, I think Russ probably like, he named his LLC Roger Bike. I think he's very, very interested in having people do that and not drive. And I think that like this, if it needs to change, like it, we can, this is not set in stone. Like, can we make it more pedestrian friendly? Maybe, yeah, definitely. But like, I um, hear the, the points taken. And I think something else, the last thing I'll say before I shut up is that all of these parcels, all these blocks are going to have internal pedestrian paths within them. So if you are walking up this one-way street innovation lane and you want to cut over to the parkway, do you necessarily have to go all the way up across street? Maybe not. You can probably walk through the block, through interior courtyards and that sort of thing. And that's that's the kind of detail that we just don't know yet. So let, let me try to put something constructive to go with my complaint there. So I, I do appreciate that you're all kind of thinking along the same lines as me and have similar objectives. And there are realities, yeah, can you react? But is there a possibility of perhaps some elevated crossing within this development so that people who are, say, trying to get to school at the elementary school from Lakeside neighborhood, they can just take a raised pathway and go from one end of this development to the other without worrying about the parkway at all? So that when people are walking through this area in winter, they can stay a little bit warmer while they're visiting their neighbors. I've seen that kind of thing mm -hmm. really well. Build, a building to building. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's a lot of that in Montreal, for example. Yeah, Minneapolis does that. And it works really well. Let's um, note that, Andy. Um, I can't tell you how many times the word reality has been used tonight. I, I started counting. I started actually making check marks, and and I stopped because there are too many. It's too many times. So there are other realities, you know. The, one of the realities, and the one that gets talked about the most here, is um, how much it's going to cost. And here's what we want, but here's the reality. You know, that's sort of the way we built the Champlain Parkway was, well, this is what we want. I mean, you know, you talk about people who've been involved with this all these years. I remember being at a school meeting at Champlain School with, with Chapin and other people, and here's what we want. But the reality is that we have to do it this way. Well, one of the other realities that hasn't been mentioned very much tonight is the climate catastrophe. Mm -hmm. And that is a reality. And that is a reality that's bearing down on us really quickly. So we built this giant road, you know, it's gonna be 25 miles an hour. I'll wait to see who can enforce that. <laughs> but um, to create this road, we did so much to, uh, let me say, uh, destroy the earth, you know, to create this road that we had to build because the federal government did it. That's a reality. But the reality is that all of this building is going to have a huge impact on, it, on the world we live in. So I want to talk more about that reality. You know, besides the reality of, you know, it's going to cost this much, and this is something we want, but only aspirationally, 
we really have to get serious about uh, not only community and building a community space into this, because that's really important, but thinking about it not just, you know, sort of aspirationally, like ride your bike, I think that's a great name, um, but we really have to make it real because what's happening to us, you know, we talk about five to 10 years, what is our life going to be like in five to 10 years? Really, what is our life going to be like? It's going to be very different from what it is now. And part of that is, as it gets to be 90 degrees every single day of the summer, you know, part of it is flooding in the inner veil yesterday and today. Part of it is, you know, the, uh, the reality all over the world of the impacts of what's going on. We can't just keep going on the way we've been going and say, well, we'd like to make it better, but you know, the reality is investors aren't going to invest in it unless we have this. You know, so I, I want to make a pitch for a different reality. You're exactly right, Andy. Um, that's that is reality. Um, I agree. Um, we can do more. Um, we can build more climate commitments into the development agreement. We have talked a little bit. It's, it's sort of we probably underplayed the degree to which we have talked internally about climate. I know it's big. And it's like sort of a fundamental issue for Ross and his team is climate and you know climate change and the emergency. It's built into all of the city's policy documents, acknowledging that there's a climate emergency. And like that is true. And I wholeheartedly agree with you. I've been advocating specifically for mass timber buildings, for passive house buildings. We've had lots of meetings with Burlington Electric Department. They've been at the table trying to figure out a way to reduce the sort of energy use that these buildings and these landscapes are going to require. There's really sustainable ways of building landscapes with existing materials. Those are things we've not talked about with the team. There's a lot of concrete over here. Can some of that concrete be reutilized in the plazas and open spaces? Yes. Is that a way to mitigate potential carbon impacts of this project? Yes. Can it be beautiful? Yes. We can talk about these things. I I agree. Like we we have to do more as a community in the city. And that's all I can say. I mean, like, yes, I, I acknowledge your the reality that you raised is the most pressing reality facing us right now. Um, and even you know, some of the other realities that we've not talked about, you know, the, the sort of focus on equity is going to be really big with this administration and this development agreement is going to be crafted um, under the current mayor and we can believe that she's going to really advocate for it. Charles, uh, is, is it about to get the new building code so we can build mass timber? Actually, yeah, you know, like um, the mayor has asked for legislative priorities coming from each of the department heads and, you know, I'm advocating, I'm just interim right now, but advocating for the legislature to change the building code to allow more mass timber buildings and to allow more single stair buildings, uh, which is ultimately a better type of building for families and it's better for the climate. There's all sorts of things, conversations. If you can send me, like this is a dialogue, if you can send me some sort of a to-do list, we can work on it. Yeah. Um, so, uh... Just, I, I think there's an opportunity to, and I would invite us to really work seriously as I'm thinking about this and the industries and the possibility of restaurants. And it's, I have more questions than and I'm curious. The, um, how will the parking, will these mobile hubs accommodate? Um, Parking for restaurants as well as residents. I mean, as I think about it, the more mixed use you get, the more the need for public parking is experience and the more demand on the areas around. I really, really urge you to look at the whole area, Lakeside, Ula, this new development, this whole area, because I'm not sure you'll attract restaurants and the public wants people can come and park nearby, and I don't. I, it's a it's a it's a challenge. It's a creative opportunity. It's a real dilemma, 
And I really would like our neighborhood, Hula, the city, to roll up. I'm, I'm a lakeside resident. To roll up our sleeves and figure this out because it's going to be huge. Like that. Can I just um, ask you a Charles? question? Like, uh, I just want to, great comment. I love it. How far would you walk uh, to go to, like, if, if you're going to a restaurant, how many blocks would you walk? I'm just curious. I'm not like, this is- I'm a, a walker and a runner, so I'm probably not. So I mean, our, probably, but our assumption is that people would park in this mobility hub or this mobility hub and walk a couple blocks yeah. to a restaurant. Great. Can you accommodate your residents and the people coming to a restaurant such that people wouldn't be invited to park in the lakeside Absolutely. neighborhood or the whole park, yeah, wherever. Chavin will not let this project happen <laughs> if it means that more people are parking in your neighborhood. Well, what well, about if you set up some kind of the restaurants community can work together and set up a shovel where people can shovel Enough to walk, 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 they can park somewhere and have a shovel. Or... Shuttles, uh, free bikes to, to move around, scooters, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, I think one, one important thing to add, I'll just say quickly, is that you know, one of the things we're thinking about in terms of ground, ground floor activation, um, we, we, we're hearing restaurants a lot. I, I Personally, I don't think we need any more restaurants. I think we're doing okay. I think the consideration for the ground floor is all about what are the six things that people in this neighborhood need to do to get into their car and actually do as an errand or anything like that. So if we if we put some thinking around deterring people have to get in their car to run the six most common errands they have to run every single day and provide that on the ground floor instead, we're, we're creating community. We're creating spaces and places for the community to get together and to interact. And we're making best use of our ground floor spaces because now those are not necessarily uses that become destinations for other people outside the neighborhood to come into. And instead they're servicing the needs, the most common needs of the neighborhood and deterring them from having to go outside the neighborhood in their vehicle to go service those needs. So we're putting a lot of thought into the uses of the ground floor. They're primarily gonna be uses of the neighborhood that will allow them to do those things inside the neighborhood and not have to leave the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. and they're less likely to be destinations for people outside the neighborhood who want to come into the neighborhood, right? And also to strengthen connections to where existing retail and restaurants are, Pine Street. Yeah. So we're, in other words, we're not trying to portray ourselves as, you know, a, a neighborhood apart, but the part of a larger South End district. And, and so really kind of rely on on those services and restaurants that are that are already and support them rather than compete with them. So it might I not be a restaurant, it might be a cafe, a little cafe, or maybe a deli or yeah. a pharmacy. So right. 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 bike shop. Yeah. yeah. If I could just add to that thing I like about that idea also is you know, I was concerned about the traffic and when it would be coming. And you know, if you have a real, you know, a real neighborhood, real you know, family oriented, whatever. Um, you don't want traffic at midnight, you know, or one o'clock in the morning, depending on what the venue is, you know, so that to me, that's an important consideration, you know. Uh, well, it, it also encourages people to get out of their car. I mean, it, it reinforces that idea that, that with more pedestrian connections, you're gonna reduce traffic impacts right in, in this area. Yeah. I just want to acknowledge the time. If folks have to go, reach out to us. This is the first in the series of meetings. I think we're coming back to the MPA in September, MPA in September. There's also going to be a public open house in September before a council work session, hopefully. We do have a couple more hands from folks we haven't heard from, so we'll stay a little while if you need to leave. Yeah, how about we do next steps and then we'll, those of us need to stay and then, you know, uh, we'll do a couple. Can I just can I just tell you one quick thing? Um, one of the really strategic ideas was to have this parking structure centered on the Champlain College property, which is centered in the whole neighborhood, not the new neighborhood. That's but number eight. The number eight yeah. mobility hub, right? So yeah. it does serve. Because if you look out here, it may be at eight o'clock at night. 
Could a restaurant use that for parking? Sure. Um, so then when we're talking mobility health, we're talking shared, shared district, shared parking, shared facilities, or shared car share for yeah. the area. Um, and I think that's what Champlain is kind of committed to is that oh, we don't need our parking all the time. Um, so how could we work together as a as an entity where you know the, the parking structures here, the mobility hubs really are serving a shared vision for all of those different modes. Yeah. Now, you have a next step slide, yeah, though, I think, do. Charles. So rather than me try to remember all of this, I yeah. ask you, I would just note that as the director of the Community and Economic Development Office, that 68 Sears Lane is a property which was acquired 20-ish um, years ago. The purpose was a South End um, mobility hub, or I think we called it a multimodal trans transit center. It was going to be a place for the buses, the bikes, and it was it was uh, aspirational around the idea that maybe someday we'll have light rail that will be nearby because uh, there is a track pretty close. So, um, but the 68 Sears Lane is really the city's um, part of this project at a little over three acres, and it will be very much a, uh, a focus of what are the city's objectives that can be achieved um, either on that land or if that land gets combined with other, um, you know development plans, there's going to be an objective for public good that comes from that, from that 3.3 acres. Uh, I just wanted to add that piece. Um, and I think Charles has a better handle on what our next steps are, but we do have a um, really, I think, an important um, upcoming work session, which is a chance for the public to hear, but also participate in city council discussion over this whole concept that, that is laid out here, both in the memorandum of, of um, understanding and the pre-development agreement, um, but really will lay the groundwork for what are the public goals and objectives yeah. that's coming up. We don't have an actual date, but it's going to be probably mid-September, maybe mid, second, mid, mid to late September. September yeah. Yeah. yeah, second or third week. Um, let me just, can I just go through this and then I want to go to the here corn. She's been waiting to ask a question or to say something for a while now, and then we'll go back over here. We're here now. Um, the, this meeting is um, a first sort of neighborhood meeting. This typically would have happened at the NPA, but the NPA is not meeting for July or August. Um, the team collectively will be taking this to the city's sort of like um, DBW permitting inspections uh, to get feedback on a draft. Uh, sketch plan. So that will be happening over the course of August um, with the technical review committee, which is an internal city staff meeting, and then a sketch plan meeting with the development review board. It's not like an official official DRB meeting for the project. There's no development application yet. It's the concept that you're seeing tonight, which will be is what's shared with them. Again, another NPA meeting in September in a public open house, also an online engagement period that's gonna be happening in, this, in the next few weeks through the next two months, all culminating in that council work session that Brian mentioned in September. That really is meant to be the point at which the mayor and the council get to dive deep into this work, get their sort of priorities for any commitments in, into a draft development agreement, and then hopefully uh, get to a development agreement by the end of the year. And then this work continues, right? Like all these comments about program, like this is gonna continue for the next- What's the date again in September meeting? It's not scheduled yet, but I think we're uh, the 16th or around then, don't quote me on that, that's probably not right, but um, let's go back here. Okay, so this is a huge project and I've heard a lot of great ideas tonight, but my biggest concern is that we're doing all this talking about the development before the Champlain Parkway is actually open and we won't know the impact of that kind of traffic on Lakeside for two years apparently. And whenever there's construction out here in Lakeside and the flag people are out here and we're down to one lane, you have to add 10-15 minutes to your time to get someplace because you could be stopped on Lakeside for an extra 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah. And that's just because the flag people want to just have a single lane. What is the Champlain Parkway going to do to us trying to get out of our neighborhood when there's this stream of cars trying to get on the Pine Street? So there's no way that's going to be quick. Yeah. 
We've we, had, there is traffic analysis that supports and underpins the city's review of this. And ultimately that traffic analysis has to say that the future condition after this thing is built cannot be below a certain sort of grade. I don't know the specifics as well as Jacob does. If you, if you have anything to add, Jacob, but ultimately we know there's challenges now and there's but the city plans is, to mitigate that. We, we've been worked with the city in terms of the traffic um, study that incorporates the impacts from what uh, this development will be using estimated trip ends and been working with um, the city's traffic consultant. So we're, we're incorporating what the expected um, impacts would be on the existing network to ensure that we're not tripping or being, you know, not creating an undue negative impact. Yeah, it's probably not exactly what you wanted to hear, right? But I mean, no. rest assured <laughs> that um, the traffic analysis is being done and we have, you know, DPW's team is on this. They've been at the table throughout this process, looking at the data, looking at, we've got consultants looking at it too. I'm happy to talk back to them. It's good to see you. And the, the reality is there will be a whole new network available to Lakesiders that currently doesn't exist. The only way in and out of our neighborhood now is Lakeside Avenue and Pine Street. Once you hit Lakeside, where there'll be a new traffic light in the parkway, that gives you additional opportunities. If you're going south, you don't have to go to Pine Street. If you're going north, you will have to still use Pine Street. But it's, it's a network. We've done traffic analyses. I believe it's going to work. If it doesn't, we have projections that says it's going to work. We can modify. We can change the signal cycle. We can look at change in circulation. There are options. There's, there's additional network opportunities here for this project. When you have network, you have opportunities, more ways to go than just one. Okay. Yeah. And I know where you live. <laughs> <laughs> right next to the project, and I'm all for it. <laughs> That's going to be great. I haven't heard from any people talking about that. Why are these so expensive? Are we going to be able to keep this whole area affordable for people? Because it sounds like parking is high, things like that. Lost, I'm, I'm amazed. I'm amazed that this was the first question that we've got. Yeah, the the requirement here is for 15% affordable at 65% of the area median income. The I almost said the reality, but CHT is part of the sort of team here, and I think they're not they're not like on the tier one team, but. CHT, Champlain Housing Trust, typically when they build housing, they're not just looking at that 65% target, they're building housing for some, in some cases, folks who don't have any income, a lot of folks who make 30% of the area median income, working class people, they're committed to being part of this project. So yes, that's going to be, a, there's going to be that guaranteed 15% of affordable housing. In addition, the state as a program where if there's a commitment to build 20% affordable housing, so that's an additional 5% at 80% area median income. That's where that you know extra floor of height and some additional, let, let's just call it density for, for ease well, I'm just is granted. That feel that so yes. Keep all the things around the services reasonable too. Yeah. The restaurants and the I mean yeah. inflation and all this this problem with the the climate, something like that, it's all getting expensive. Again, going to be able to get people. The administration is committed to having this be an affordable project. We've not heard from you yet, so let's go back here and then we'll go back to Lena. Yeah, a couple of comments. There's so much to unpack, but um, I do think that you know the city's been focused on neighborhoods and housing in neighborhoods. And I think this is a really good way to get some housing that doesn't affect the neighborhoods in the same way that the backyard developments and that. And, and so, you know, I support that. It, it's gonna change things. We're having growing pains. We're getting a new highway. I mean, we're saying we want the bike and so on and so forth, but we're putting in a new road so we can have more cars. And I think the elephant in the room is that there's population growth and we need that for economic 
stability and I mean there's a whole bunch of stuff that um, you know relating to what you're talking about how the world is changing and, and how we affect that um, but I do see this as an opportunity a really good opportunity to take a parking lot and turn it into something instead of putting so much uh, pressure on on the neighborhoods and so I do support that and I would love to be as, as involved as I can and help to, you know, bounce ideas around and shape things. One thing that I'm, uh, this is sort of a small thing, there's a million things, but um, lighting, um, LED lighting is great. There's so many opportunities, but it's misused so, so much. The, the cold 6,000, 5,000 K light that we're seeing going all over the place and people just don't understand how that affects our psyche and how it affects wildlife. And, and, um, and so I'm really a proponent of, of really thoughtful lighting and, 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 uh, and warm 2700 K lighting. And I think all of our street lamps should be that. I mean, we're just like blasting things. I don't, I'm not sure people really know how this is affecting, but I've read lots of articles and I just know how it makes me feel. And so, you know, this is all part of it. And there's so many things to think about here, but I do think it's a good opportunity to get housing. I mean, as long as we're increasing population and bringing people, we're going to need it. So um, I think this is a good place to do it. And although it will definitely have an impact on us in the neighborhood, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I do think it, it, it's, a, it's a good project. And if it's well done, I think we have a great opportunity. So I think a lot of things that people have talked about here um, have made a lot of sense. And uh, I hope it can be done in, in a way that, that it's comfortable for everyone and, and provides some of the things that we need. So. Thank you. Just, um, I don't know, I didn't, I'm not sure if I said No, that you, no, it's it's awesome. great specific comments about lighting and general comments, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'd love to get involved with the city on. Sounds like you know a lot. On lighting, well, I, I know some and, and I see mistakes being made all the time. Yeah. Okay. In lighting, and uh, I I'd love to get involved with the city on, you know, some of that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I see a lot of this community engagement piece revolving around the board by NPA. Yeah. Um, you have to ask us if you want to come, um, and then you have to not do it like this, please. Um, this is so much information. This is hours and hours of time. We've lost a bunch of people. If you actually want to do community engagement, you need to send out a bunch of reminders about when you're going to have a meeting. There needs to be a Zoom link ahead of time. You need to ask the Ward 5 NPA. You can actually come in September because maybe you can. Like, there's this is great if you involve us and we're not just going to like comb through the front porch forum calendar looking for when there's a meeting. So I am glad there was a packed room. I see there's a much less packed room. And I just want to wholeheartedly encourage you to do a little better job of outreach and actually think about meeting people in a way that is actually going to make it possible for us to be involved. I agree. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> Thank you for sticking around more than two hours.